Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we are talking about why startups can no longer hide from SOC 2 compliance anymore with co-founder and CEO of Drata, Adam Markowitz. We all know that B2B SaaS startups focus most of their time and resources on generating revenue and building products, but rarely focus too much on security and compliance until that large whale of a prospect starts making requests to see your security controls before signing up as a customer. For anyone who has ever worked at a B2B startup, we've all seen that mad rush to answer extensive security questionnaires while trying to implement new security controls in order to not lose that deal. On today's show, we ask Adam to explain why the process of becoming SOC 2 compliant has just started to become a bit easier due to platforms like Drata to help rescue startups from the SOC 2 black hole. We get Adam to explain the expected cost and time commitment for when a customer asks for a SOC 2 audit and how startups can ease the stress by preparing ahead of time. Finally, we ask Adam to share how Drata helps make this process so seamless and digestible for startups being forced to consider SOC 2 compliance and how his company has been able to maintain growth at 100% month over month after only launching his platform in January of this year. Now let's get into this week's episode with co-founder and CEO of Drata, Adam Markowitz. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Adam. Thanks for having me. So this will be a pretty important discussion today for a lot of B2B startups out there trying to land enterprise deals. I remember working at my last startup, selling software to global financial firms and learning about SOC 2 compliance for the first time. It was pretty intense from what I remember and not something many CEOs or CTOs look forward to. Chances are a lot of early stage startups have gone through the same experience as they try to move up market and sell to larger enterprises. So Adam, I'd love to kick things off with what becoming SOC 2 compliant really means and why historically it has been not an easy feat for a lot of startups to achieve. So being or becoming SOC 2 compliant, It means that you've designed and implemented controls across your organization to help ensure the security, availability, privacy, confidentiality, and integrity of your customers' data. Uh, And a control, you can think is just any policy process or tool you put in place to help really prevent a bad thing from happening or to help ensure a good thing happens. I always use the bicycle helmet analogy, right? A risk to riding your bike is head injury if you fall off. So bicycle helmet is a control to help prevent or at least mitigate the chance of that bad thing happening to your head. At your company, a control can be a password policy you put in place to help prevent weak passwords from being hacked. Um, and so why that hasn't been easy, you know, historically, one is knowing what controls to put in place. Um, SOC 2 isn't a prescriptive framework like others. It doesn't actually give you the controls. It gives you a set of criteria. And it's up to you to design and implement controls to satisfy that criteria. Um, so because it's not prescriptive, you're not going to, you know, you're going to find that every company satisfies the criteria using a different set of controls. So there's nuance to each company. Something that works for one might not even work or apply to another. Um, it also means that not every audit firm that will test your controls in the same way or use the same mapping. So there's extra ambiguity that just adds to the confusion, especially if you've never done it before. Um, but the biggest pain in getting SOC 2 audit ready is the time. You know, it takes hundreds of hours of work to design and implement and then collect evidence of these controls. Right? And you collect evidence of them to provide to your customers and then of course, to your auditors. Um, so that's hundreds of screenshots, spreadsheets, shared drive folders. And these controls span everything across your org, right? From engineering and DevOps to HR, and then everything in between. So it's a never-ending cycle of ensuring these controls are operating effectively and that you can prove it during an audit. So even after you achieve SOC 2 compliance, now you need to maintain it, and you're collecting and storing and mapping that evidence all year, every year, forever. Yeah, it's not the sexiest topic, but it's definitely something you can't avoid as a startup founder. I kind of think about it like updating your fire extinguishers and your CO2 monitors in your house. It's not the insurance. It's the actual monitoring of things inside your house that needs to be continually changing the batteries and updating things around the home, right? Yeah, I like that analogy. (laughs) Feel free to use that one. But we all know that SaaS startups focus most of their time and resources on revenue generation, marketing, product, and customer satisfaction but rarely focus too much on security and compliance until a large enterprise customer starts asking questions pertaining to security controls and if the company can provide them with an independent third-party attestation report. So for those of us lucky enough to be a part of building startups, we've all seen that mad rush to answer question customer or customer questionnaires, extensive security questionnaires, and then implement those customer-required cybersecurity controls in order to close that big deal which unfortunately ends up swallowing an organization's time and resources in the hopes to land that big whale, right? So what can you explain the process of becoming SOC 2 compliant really is about? And how can people think about getting started about that? And how did Drata come around to rescue some of these startups with SOC 2 black hole fears? 
Well, you're absolutely right. Right, as important as it is to build secure software and then earn the trust of your customers, for most startups, it's not the first thing on your mind. And you wake up, and it's not the last thing before you go to sleep. And that's that's really only because as a startup, you have other big, big priorities, right? Existential ones as a startup, like. If I can't find product market fit, it won't matter if our software is secure because there won't be any data that needs securing. All too common, myself, our team, we we actually empathize, I think, more than most here because this was exactly the situation we were in at Portfolium, our last company. You know, balancing these kinds of priorities and running headfirst into the SOC 2 hurdle, big game-changing deal on the table, or a customer that's about to churn unless you can produce a report within X months, right? So if your hair is on fire because you have a big deal pending SOC 2, like, First, know that you're not alone. <laughs> there is a path forward with automation, especially. Um, but it's best to be proactive and start on security and SOC 2 before your hair is on fire. Um, it used to be that only selling way up market into the enterprise really demanded SOC 2. But you know, over the last few years, it's made its way all the way down market. So earlier and earlier and more often than ever, companies are demanding it. At the same time, new APIs and tech have really made it possible to automate the process. So finally now allowing or making SOC 2 attainable for startups without distracting them from those other existential priorities or you know, without costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, some of it's because of just new APIs that become available. The whole shift, the whole move to the cloud has really helped here. Um, also just more companies looking to solve an ever-growing problem that the market conditions really created here. So lots of options now and, and finally a balanced playing field, right? So startups can actually do this as well. It seems like the bulk of SOC 2 resources are meant for larger, more traditional companies. So why is SOC 2 compliance becoming so important for startups these days? Sure. Yeah, I mean, vendor risk management is key to any security program. So, you know, if your vendor is breached and now there's a vector into your organization or your customer's data is now exposed because of this, it really doesn't matter if that vendor is a startup or not, right? The outcome's the same. So you, you could almost argue, right, there's more reason to scrutinize the security posture of your startup vendors than your larger vendors, depending on the data they have access to, because chances are that startup vendor doesn't have a well-staffed or well-funded security team behind the scenes, right? So uh, when going through any vendor evaluation, your prospect needs to really ensure you have the bare minimum in place. And SOC 2 has really become the, the bar by which companies gain that comfort and trust, right? Five years ago, I'd say that SOC 2 helped tell companies, you know, which vendors to do business with, where today, not having SOC 2 is telling companies which vendors not to do business with, right? So it's gone from this nice to have to just must have table stakes just within the last few years. Interesting. So you're like, everything's so interconnected now, no matter if it's startup or SMEs or large enterprises, that everyone could be exposed to a vendor attack because they do some business with someone else. And that's where you're trying to present it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Wow. You know, I feel like only savvy tech startups started using SOC 2 compliance as a competitive differentiator early on, as you said, maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago as it was a powerful way to brand and market to global customers that your startup was more established and more credible and attuned to customers' needs. But now I feel like SOC 2 is sort of par for the course. Is that the case for all B2B startups or are many still avoiding it like the plague? Yeah, I mean, one of the many, many reasons we couldn't wait to build and launch Strata was the fact that we witnessed ourselves, you know, firsthand SOC 2 moving from this nice to have competitive advantage to must have table stakes requirement, right? It was it was 2017 to 2019, we were selling our software at Portfolio into higher education, so university campuses. And the requests for the SOC 2 became more frequent, then they weren't requests anymore, and then they actually became that bare minimum. So we saw it happen. We knew it was going to continue in this direction to the point where even if you tried to avoid it, you wouldn't be able to for long. And, and we felt so strongly, too, that you, you shouldn't avoid it, right? You don't need to avoid it if you do it the right way and for the right reasons. And so yeah, it's been extra rewarding bringing Trotta to market. Yeah, I remember trying to explain to our founders and CEOs when they ever started to talk about SOC 2, like never to avoid it, like educate yourself on it, really understand why customers are going to be asking for it and try to prepare for it. But then when they started going down that rabbit hole of, you know, where do they start? You know, there weren't companies like Drawdown around to try and help them. And you're saying because of like the cloud and AWS, it's made it a lot easier for people to start that journey down the path of SOC 2 compliance. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, automation has really unlocked the, the ability for any company, um, even a, a very, very small, you know, two person startup in a garage to go and get their first SOC 2 report. Okay, so let's dig into why startups can't hide from SOC 2 compliance anymore. Let's imagine one of our portfolio companies at Ripple is pitching a prospective client who asked for a SOC 2 report. What's the first thing they should know? The, the first thing they should know, um, and maybe if your listeners, you know, walk away from today with one thing, let's, let's have it be this, right? SOC 2 is not a certification. 
It's an attestation. So the result of a SOC 2 audit is not a certificate or a certification. So please just avoid, avoid using the phrase SOC 2 certified. It's got to be one of the most commonly misused phrases, right? The result of any SOC 2 audit is a SOC 2 attestation report. It's an independent third-party CPA firm that's attesting to the design and operating effectiveness of your controls, satisfying the SOC 2 criteria. It's a mouthful, but that's, that's what it is. So the goal right here is in completing your audit isn't just to get through the audit or check a box. It's very easy to look at it through that lens when it's being demanded by a prospect at the finish line of you know, a big deal, right? Um, but the goal is to have a clean SOC 2 report, free of any exceptions or qualified opinions. These are you know, auditor remarks or dings if they find anything during the audit. Uh, so that's that's first. Uh, second thing to know, if you're being asked for a SOC 2 report, it's likely because this prospect, this prospective customer understands your software is gonna be processing or storing their data and they need to trust that you have the right controls in place or at least the bare minimum in place to keep it secure, right? It's because part of their own SOC 2 compliance requires them to prove that they've reviewed and gained comfort with your security program. This is again, why it's not a check the box that prospect is going to actually be reviewing your SOC 2 report. They're not just asking for you to show it. They're going to actually read it. And so you want a good, clean one. Um, third, I could promise that if you're being asked for a SOC 2 report, it, it's not going to be the last time. Um, so best way to earn the trust of this prospect and all those that are going to follow is prove you deserve that trust by getting getting your SOC 2 report, right? If you're a venture-backed software company, chances are good you're, you're already doing a lot of great things when it comes to your security posture. One, one, why not just get credit for that and then fill in the gaps where you need to? Like if nothing else, you're going to sleep a lot better at night knowing you're doing what you should be doing. Um, so those are kind of like the first things right off the bat that I would want any you know, B2B SaaS company to know when they dive in. That's really helpful. And I appreciate you sharing that with, with us. There are two kinds of SOC 2 that I've read about. The SOC 2 Type 1 versus SOC 2 Type 2. What's the difference and what is more valuable? Also, what kind of content do you typically see in these reports? Now, whether you're doing a SOC 2 Type 1 or a Type 2, they're both the same SOC 2 framework. Um, the only difference here is a, a Type 1, it's a point-in-time audit, basically answering, like, are you compliant today? Um, the Type 2 is done over an audit period of usually 12 months, but for that first one, you could do them in four to six months, where you're basically showing that you've stayed compliant. So it's a much higher bar for a SOC 2 Type 2. It's harder to achieve. But that's why it's it's really the gold standard here, right? A, now, a SOC 2 Type 1 report is still better than nothing because it's, it's still an independent third-party attestation, right? But Type 2 is what you're eventually going to need um, and then need to maintain with that yearly audit where you show that you stayed compliant for the prior 12 months. So kind of sum all that up by saying you could cram for a Type 1 uh, and do it pretty quick. <laughs> Not the case for a Type 2. Um, so a Type 2 is definitely more valuable, carries a lot more weight. But what's the timing on type one? How fast can you turn it around if someone comes in and asks for it? It's a good question. And there's a lot of noise out there. And so I'll, I'll choose my words carefully. It really does depend on the size of your company, the maturity of your program to start. I could tell you we've had startups, less than 50 employees starting from absolute scratch, get audit ready in two weeks. That's about the fastest we've seen. Wow. And then basically two weeks of, of work um, to go get audit ready using an automation tool like Drata. Um, and then you could either start your type two audit period or kick off a type one audit right then and there. And are you seeing people try to get through the type one to get to type two on their own, or are they only going to type two because somebody else is asking for it? So we see a lot of companies that need to report as quickly as possible, as you can imagine, the whole hair on fire scenario. But we're we're optimistic and we're glad to see that they're they understand like this is this isn't a one and done check the box thing. So they know they're going to do a type two, but they also need something quick. And so they'll do a type one on the way to a type two. Uh, we partner with a lot of audit firms that will actually bundle pricing for a type one and type two if they know they're going to be done within the same 12 month period. So that's really attractive for companies in this kind of scenario. Because again, you could do the type one quickly and it's the same work. It's all the same stuff that applies to that type two. So you're just getting audit ready, doing a type one audit and basically kicking off your type two audit period all, all at once. Oh, that's smart. That's kind of like people who are studying for like one state bar exam and they want to go and apply for some other state. So they just write the same one a month later because it's usually the same content. There you go. That was when I wanted to be a lawyer, but that doesn't make <laughs> sense anymore. So what kind of content are you typically seeing in these reports between the two? So yeah, the, the SOC 2 report consists of five sections. Um, it's consistent. So section one is the auditor's opinion. It's really the opinion on whether controls are suitably designed and operating effectively. Because summary, right, the, the scope and type of the audit is also included in that section one. 
Section two is the management's assertion, right? So it's a letter on your company's letterhead basically saying, I assert that everything in here is, is complete and accurate, including our system description, which is section three, the system description. And this is something a lot of companies going through and not for the first time just don't realize you have to create. Ironically, it's it's a description of everything, you know, your infrastructure, your software, people, data, processes, controls. Um, it's all stuff that's getting audited. <laughs> so it's basically you saying, okay, auditor, here's the description of our entire system. Please go audit this and attest to this. But if you've never done it before, you might not know you need to do that. It could be like an 18 to 20 page document. Some audit firms will help you here. They have templates, but you have to be the one to officially write it, of course. And then section four is kind of the meat potatoes, right? It's the result of all the control testing that happens during the audit. So when you eventually hand a prospect the SOC 2 report, a lot of attention, that's where their eyes are going to go. They want to see if there was any exceptions um, in those control tests that were run during the audit. And section five is the last section. It's optional. It's if there are exceptions, that's where you'll have the opportunity to respond to them, basically justify them or give some sort of explanation. So that's that's the makeup of a SOC 2 report. That's awesome. Thank you so much for getting into the detail because I definitely have not been through a type two. I will definitely call you next time I have to go with, through that with one of our portfolio founders. You know, one of the biggest concerns our founders have with these type of requests are around cost and time commitment. You know, if it takes six months to get your compliance program ready and you need another six months for the type two report, that's one whole year you have to wait before you even start your audit, which will likely take another month at the least. If your prospective client is asking for a year long audit, the wait gets even longer sometimes. So how should founders think about budgeting time and cost for these types of requests from potential clients? So time is by far the most expensive aspect here. Like I can tell you for a fact that the earlier you pursue SOC 2, the faster it is, therefore the cheaper it is, and then the easier it is to maintain as you grow. The irony though here, of course, again, is companies will wait until their hair's on fire and it's, it takes longer, it's more expensive, and it's just the reason why people <laughs> don't like talking about it. Um, so if you're a B2B SaaS company and you haven't been asked for SOC 2 report yet, start now. If you're already being asked for it, definitely start now. Um, I would say leverage an automation tool, of course, because it's, if it's a good one, it's going to put you on the fastest, most efficient path to getting and then staying audit ready. Um, you know, like a tool like Gerardo will actually help you before you get that first report in hand. Because um, again, you're getting the report to prove your security posture to your customers or prospects. We have built-in reports in Drata that do just that ahead of your first audit. So it's been a great way for our customers to show that they're doing the right things, they're well on their way, uh, and they can prove it. Um, it also helps you save from a cost perspective. Like You won't need to purchase as many additional things if you're using a tool like Drata on your way to your first audit. Uh, and then there's also even discounted pricing on things like the actual audit itself when you use uh, Drata. So again, the earlier you start, the better. Leverage automation. Um, and, and have it become part of your culture uh, of your company, right? This isn't a check the box thing. It's never going away. Um, but if you use automation, it's actually going to save you more time as your company grows. How can startups, though, instill that you know culture of cybersecurity right from the start? You mentioned it, but like it's not something I see a lot of our early stage startups talking about. So how do you suggest they instill that type of cybersecurity culture right from the beginning? So your, your people are your first line of defense. They're also your first... like attack vector. So it's, it's vital you instill that culture and do it as early as possible. Um, I think the best way is to empower each employee to be responsible for their own cybersecurity, right? Educate them on, on how a breach could affect your startup. Most employees, especially early ones, have equity, like real ownership and the success of the company. And if they understand that cybersecurity is part of their job, they know what they need to do, um, they're going to take pride in it rather than scoff at it. Provide them with regular training, so you can incorporate things that actually matter to them in that training. So spotting social engineering or phishing exercises and simulations, these are great. Um, they're just a great way of kind of jolting people into reality of like what something like this, something as innocent as clicking a link in an email can actually do to your company, your equity in that company. That's interesting. So what kind of other examples for people who aren't necessarily part of like the engineering or DevOps team? So someone who's on sales or marketing, like what kind of things should you be doing? Obviously two-factor authentication, running some of these exercises. What other suggestions do you have for founders out there to be building a cybersecurity culture from the start? Yeah, I mean, making sure their endpoint is configured properly and why you do certain things. Again, I, I come back to that phishing simulation. Like We run them here monthly. Um, and it's I can tell you, when you get an email that looks like it's from Carta and tells you to click here to accept your shares, 
can imagine how many employees would want to click that button um, without hovering over it or seeing where it's going to take them and then worse where it does take them and what kind of information they'd be filling in there right so little things like that they actually transcend right into your daily life you get a, a phony email from what looks like bank of america and you're going to be that much more prepared for that when it happens and so you know things like that they just they start becoming you do it from the early days it just becomes part of your culture Wow. I mean, everyone wants to see the falling confetti coming down from their part of <laughs> certificates accepted. Everyone loves that. So I totally get it. But it's interesting you say that, especially at like tech startups where you think everyone is very tech forward and tech literate. You know, it's only like your grandmother you think is going to be baited into clicking on a link for a Bank of America $3,000 credit card or something. But it actually happens more at startups than you think, right? Yeah, especially on mobile, right? Because you can't really you could ho- you can't really hover. You have to like kind of hold hold down on the link and see where it's going to take you. And then when it does take you somewhere, it's it's harder to spot a phony uh, phony landing page on mobile, especially when the URL is hidden. So yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting. You know, with smaller startups, who do you typically suggest manage this type of process, especially when the CEO is non technical? So you know, one of our startup customers actually just completed their their Type Two audit, and it was the head of marketing that managed the process, and they did a fantastic job. So. We've seen that. Um, we've seen cases at startups where it's you know the CTO, or VP of engineering, or, or DevOps engineer that leads the charge. We've had COOs, project managers lead it. Um, it's it's kind of nice that again with automation, it could be a wide range of, of different kinds of people that could do it. Um, obviously, for our larger customers, it's the head of compliance, head of information security, or even a CISO. But um, for startups, you kind of have more optionality there. So is that a testament to how good the Drata platform is that even a marketing person can do it? No offense to marketing people out there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's something we took a lot of pride in. And it was just a, a great case study, use case to, to see. That's awesome. You know, a lot of people talk about SOC 2 uh, and cybersecurity and all this stuff as like a cost center and never really a revenue generator. They never say, what's the ROI on getting our SOC 2 compliance? But have you thought about how to kind of change the messaging on that for a lot of your customers? Yeah, we, we try to avoid selling on fear, right? Because there's, there's plenty of that out there in the security world. Um, it works because the cost, especially to a startup, it could be existential. But I like the flip side that we were just talking about, right? The the opportunities that it unlocks, right? Being enterprise ready and, and what that means to your to your company. So plenty of kind of ROI calculators out there. Um, then there's just like the pure time that you're saving, right? Engineering hours that are being not only not spent on these kind of manual repetitive compliance tasks that's actually being repurposed to do product development and a faster path to product market fit because they're not distracted. So lots of ways to to slice and dice it um and it kind of depends on on the company and where they're at what's going to resonate more that makes sense i mean you just talked about how a marketing person was able to complete the process with drata you know everyone always talks about the horror stories when it comes to the whole audit process and how manual and tedious it is you know most ceos or ctos dread the thought of dealing with an endless array of screenshots and downloads so how does drata help make this process so seamless and digestible for startups being forced to consider that SOC 2 compliance? So it does a lot. Um, you know, first, Drata provides all of its customers with just foundational policy templates, right? So pre-auditor approved templates that get you off the ground quickly uh, without having to Google and kind of Frankenstein together a bunch of policies that you're not super confident in. Um, it also has this common control framework built in. So it's pre-mapped to the SOC 2 criteria. You don't have to agonize over you know, which controls to implement, how to map them, and gives you a playbook essentially. Uh, but I think you know, most importantly, it's Try to connect to your tech stack. So your cloud infrastructure to your HRIS and, and basically everything in between to do continuous monitoring and evidence collection of these controls. So this means when you log in, you see exactly where you stand, you know, how audit ready you are, where you have gaps. There's instructions on how to go fill those gaps. And when you're at 100 percent, you'll see you don't have to take and store screenshots as evidence for your auditor. It's automatically captured by the software every day mapped to that control environment. So after that, you're also going to see how these controls overlap with other frameworks. So when you're done high-fiving over your SOC 2 report, you'll see how close you are to now being ISO 27001 certified and not have to redo all of that work because, again, the controls cross-map across multiple frameworks. Uh, And then the last piece is just that dedicated support, right? So solution architects, compliance experts, like former auditors on our team, um, security professionals, they're, they're all there and you're never left just abandoned to software, although the software is best in breed. We, we've been calling it autopilot. Uh, I think it's a good analogy, right? It's any day during your audit period during the year is an opportunity for a gap to form, right? Like catch it in real time, right? When the red light will start blinking, you got to pay attention, remediate that gap. You'll watch it go back to green and you're back to autopilot. Um, 
So you're no longer just checking a box for compliance, right? You're monitoring your security posture and you can prove it any given day of the year. So would Drata be considered mission critical? Like if it went down tomorrow for one of your customers, would they be calling you nonstop on the customer success line saying, hey, like we're screwed without this? So we have a very high, you know, 3.9 SLA uh, for uptime, but there would be a gap in their monitoring um, for that period if, you know, chances, if something were to happen, it comes down. Um, now, from, from a compliance standpoint, that's not the end of the world. During an audit, it, it also wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, but it's also something we're going to work really hard and have the best folks on, on board to help prevent from happening from just a pure security standpoint um, to make sure that monitoring is truly continuous for our customers. But that's a great thing to be mission critical too, right? So that your clients come to depend on you and you have a very long-term viable business relationship with them, hopefully for eternity, I guess, uh, is the hope, which is great. Yeah, that's how we enter every one of our, our customer relationships for that that long-term you know, partnership. It's been, it's been fantastic. Well, you mentioned SOC 2 and you mentioned ISO. We got to talk about HIPAA compliance. I mean, we have some health tech portfolio companies like OnCall Health and WiseDocs that work with some of the largest healthcare organizations in the world. And they have very, very strict HIPAA and HIPAA compliance protocols. So what type of safeguards should startups looking to get into a health tech space be aware of before they start selling to healthcare orgs based on what your experience is like at Trata? Yeah. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier, right, there's there's a lot of overlap between these compliance frameworks. So many of the things that you're doing for SOC 2 are going to apply for HIPAA as well. Um, Drata helps you understand and see this. Um, so, and then also help fill in those remaining gaps, right? So with HIPAA, there's specific policies on how you manage PHI, right? Protected health information. Um, so there's specific training for your employees that would ha also happen through Drata. Um, policies for how you notify customers of breaches, exposure. You're going to need signed, you know, BAAs, business associate agreements with those that engage with this PHI. So again, I, I, I come back to leverage automation. Um, a tool like Drata will show you what that overlap looks like and where you have those gaps. So you might be further further along with HIPAA than you than you think if you're already doing SOC 2. That's amazing. I remember you know, one of our companies, they were literally locking themselves into rooms with like pass cards. You couldn't get in uh, because of some of the documentation that they were processing for some of the health organizations. And I was amazed. I mean, we couldn't even do due diligence. They had to come to our office, basically, because we weren't allowed in to see what their engineers were working on, which is great. Now, what about the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer role? How important is it? And when is the right time to consider it for a startup? I can tell you, we have a great CISO here at Drata, Ross Hossman. He's also a member of uh, SBCI, Silicon Valley CISO Investors. And they, they invest in our last round, and that's how we were you know, originally connected. But uh, I'd say there's there's no standard formula here for when you hire a CISO or even a head of information security, right? It's, I think it depends on your business, who you're selling to, the kind of data you're storing or processing. These are all variables to consider. Um, you know, if you're holding highly confidential data, trying to sell the large enterprise, you're probably going to want to hire for that role sooner. If you're holding mostly metadata, selling to SMBs, you could probably wait a little bit um, and then somewhere in between. I think more importantly, I mean, maybe it's just obvious, but I'll say it anyway, just, just for the listeners, right? Hiring a CISO doesn't just automatically make you secure. Um, you really got to make sure that you bring them on at, at the right level, an executive level, they empower them, you support their program and then fund it appropriately, right? Because um, it's it's never just, a, again, check the box, nailed it kind of thing. Well, I mean, it's amazing that one, we're able to recruit CISO uh, as qualified as, as Ross, and then you also were able to get the group of Silicon Valley CISOs to invest in Andrada. And I remember when we spoke almost a year ago when you were raising your first round of financing, and you've gone on to raise over 25 million, I believe, in your last round as a Series A with GGV, which is incredible, only a few months after raising your seed round. So congratulations. Can you tell us a little bit about the company's traction this year and what your plans are for the future at Drata? Yeah, thank you very much. It's been it's been an incredible year uh, for Drata, right? We, we officially launched publicly on, on January 15th of this year. So we're just past the eight month mark and it's, it's been growing, you know, hundred percent month over month all year. Um, we're honored and, and motivated, right? There's hundreds of customers from small startups to large enterprise. Um, they're all helping us continue to just rapidly iterate on that product experience. The team itself has grown, you know, 150% over the last six months. It's going to continue to do so as we're, we're hiring across all functions right now to help just support and, and even further accelerate this growth. Um, we were just ranked the highest rated cloud compliance software on G2 for a satisfaction score. So thank you to all of our customers and the whole team for making this happen. It's really a, a testament to how customer obsessive we are at Drata. You know, if you're listening today, you have a passion for software automation, helping companies build trust, protect data. We'd love to meet you. You know, trust is our core value. We walk the walk. We live and breathe it every day. 
Um, this is the most fun I've ever had working with some of the best people, but also just the best at what they do. So uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out to us. Drata.com forward slash careers. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. That's awesome. And I assume you're hiring remotely uh, around the world and all those people have to be SOC 2 compliant as well. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah, absolutely. Hiring, hiring remote. Um, you know, the company was founded in July of last year, right in the middle of the pandemic. And so it's been remote first from, from day one. It's, it's a, it's a philosophy we've always had, um, even back at our prior company. It's we want the best talent wherever it might be. It's nice to see that companies maybe a, a pandemic kind of forced the their hand there, but everyone's kind of coming around to that being the new norm, which is great. That's awesome. Well, before we wrap things up, we always like to ask our guests for their fast favorites, where I list off five categories and you name your favorite of each. So your first one is your favorite podcast. Yeah, Masters the Scale, Reed Hoffman. Nice one, of course. Second, favorite newsletter or blog. I like TED Talks, right? Um, always something new and interesting. Favorite tech gadget? Up until we started this podcast, I was going to say my AirPods, um, but those did not work for some reason. So um, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> a lot of people are still calling out their AirPods as their best, even when they don't work on a, a morning walk on a Monday. Favorite new trend? Yeah, kind of what we just talked about, right? The hybrid work. I think, uh, again, it was something selfishly that we used to use to compete with the, the larger companies, right? Um, where they would demand butts and chairs. Now everyone can be remote first, and, and that's a great thing for everyone. So. Uh, we like that. Huge benefit for startups. We totally agree with that. And last but not least, your favorite book. I got a couple. Um, let's see, Extreme Ownership, Retired Navy SEAL, Jocko Willink's book, um, and then Relentless. If you've ever read uh, Tim Grover's book, the former trainer to Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade. That's a great one. Amazing book. We've heard that one on the podcast before, for sure. One of the best. Well, thanks for joining us, Adam, to talk about why startups cannot avoid SOC 2 anymore. Adam Markowitz, founder and CEO of Drata. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Maddie B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 